Welcome to Rebecca Sounds Reveille. This show is going to be so exciting because when I normally talk to you about talking to you, having a guest coming across the waves, I normally mean coming across the airwaves. And today I literally mean not only coming across the airwaves, the digital waves, but I mean across the oceanic waves. I have a guest who has been an unbelievable person who has been sharing a similar background as myself. In fact, this person's an author. He has been in the army, an overseas army in the UK, and served 13 years in the Royal Military Police. He specialized in the mounted branch of the military police in 1987. He was in the, we will even ask him a little bit more in depth about this, in the National Tent Pegging Championships. <laughs> and, <laughs> and after leaving in the Army, he also went on to pursue his own security business. And so he worked close protection um, as a close protection officer. And so from there, he went on to have other things that he did, including having his own business in the alcohol industry, which you'll find out a little bit more about that. And most, most recently, this is what I want to talk to him about because it shares a passion with me that I deliver to you so often. And that is about domestic abuse and its importance. And he is the founder of Domestic Abuse Business uh, Support. And this is, uh, is such a, a needed topic and it is so needed in the business industry. I, I just can't even go there. But I've got to tell you, he is also the author of 12 Steps, a Life Ready Motivational Guide. I hope you can see this here. And so welcome to the show, Robert S. Wells. Thank you for having me. I'm absolutely delighted to be coming at you from across the pond, as we say here in the UK. I am really excited about everything that you're doing because your background is absolutely phenomenal. You have been dedicated to helping others throughout your entire life. So I have to first ask you, how did you end up, and because of the differences between the United States and UK, did you have to go into the army or were, was this something that you voluntarily did? No, uh, we don't have conscription here. Uh, it was a passion that I had from the youngest age. I could never decide whether I wanted to be a police officer or a, or a soldier. And then as I grew older, I discovered that uh, I could do both. So from my earliest memories, I wanted to be in the army or as I said, a police officer. So. I was very lucky in that respect. I went on to fulfill my dreams and became a military police officer. Um, around about 15, 16 years old, uh, my later wife, um, she got me into horses. So when, whilst I was going through training uh, for the military police, uh, I discovered they also had horses. So uh, my passion, next passion was then to become a mounted police officer, which I went on to do for around about eight years. That's a long time. Yeah, well, it was just short of 13 years that I served in total. But um, to be honest with you, had the mounted branch not been closed down because of defence cuts here in the UK, I'd probably still be there now on extended service. It was one of those jobs where you couldn't wait to get in in the morning. You didn't want to go home at night because it was just such a fantastic job. It was like a small family. There was only around about 25 uh, men and women, um, a couple of seniors. Uh, so, yeah, it was, it was a fantastic job. We loved what we did. That is really neat because I don't know, I, and because I was in motor transport and my focus was on that, but I don't know if we have something like, I mean, the police department has mounted, but as far as military-wise, I don't know of uh, anything specific like that and so small of a unit because 25 is a very small, um, small yeah, sure. I, I'd like to hear from anybody who can prove me wrong, but I think I'm right in saying that we were the last remaining uh, operational mounted military police unit in the world. Mm -hmm. 
So we weren't just Sarah, most of the mounted units, in fact, all of the mounted units within the, the British Army are ceremonial. So you've got the King's Troop Royal Horse Artillery and you've got the cavalry. Uh, they're purely ceremonial, but we actually carried out a policing role. And I don't know of any other military police mounted units that do that. That's pretty exciting. So from there, you also did something called the uh, tent pegging. <laughs> You've been doing your homework, that's for sure. Oh, blimey. Yeah, um, I, I don't recall the year, but uh, I was very lucky. I think I just got lucky uh, one year and uh, I became British champion. It sounds very grand, but it was a, a rather small show where they used to bring the civilian police, the cavalry, the King's Troop, all horse artillery, uh, and pretty much anybody with a lance and a horse uh, together to compete um, for, I mean, if you don't know what tent pegging is, basically it's a, it's a lance made out of bamboo with a very sharp pointy end and a very blunt end at the bottom. You gallop flat out on your horse and you have to use the lance at flat out gallop to remove a very small piece of wood uh, going down to just an inch wide and about six inches in height from the ground on the end of the lance. And it's, it's all part of the former British uh, military uh, mounted training. So you also had sword, lance and revolver. So it's a way of training the mounted British troops in the earliest days to use a sword, lance and revolver on horseback. And that was then carried through to just uh, a more modern day sport. That sounds very meticulous. And yeah, it was great. It was great fun, especially uh, using a gun from horseback. But of course, it wasn't live rounds, thankfully. Um, but uh, yeah, it was, it was great fun. Uh, I really enjoyed those times. I do miss them even now, uh, all these years later. They, they, the uh, government closed down the mountain section in 1995. So it's been close for some time now. That's pretty interesting. Now, when you left, you know, military police and um, doing, being with the, with the mounted, I it just, I'm wondering from there, where did you go? Did you go into caregiving at that time or did you go directly over into close order protection? No. I was, I was quite lazy, to be honest. I didn't really want to accept the fact that I was actually leaving the army and going out into Civvy Street. And I think, well, I don't think, I know for a fact um, from my interactions with other ex-service personnel that it's a very, it can be a very hard transition from leaving the forces to going to Civvy Street. I mean, you may have found that yourself. Did you, yes. did you find it a smooth transition? Well, no, you know, I, I had to retire. And so that, Anytime I think that you leave, well, military-wise, um, a whole different, a whole different thing. But going from the police, the police agency to retirement has been very different, and um, it isn't the same. You live, you breathe, you do everything that has to do with law enforcement work and helping others to a civilian lifestyle, which is not as regimented, and it's just very different. So it is a hard transition. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I like you just said, you live, eat, breathe what you're doing. And um, I've been in the mountain branch for eight years. It was a job that I was absolutely devastated to lose when they closed it down. Mm -hmm. um, I, I had seen my entire adult career doing that. So it was a very hard transition. Um, and I left uh, in 1998, I actually left the services. I had a couple of friends who were working uh, in close protection in the UK, which please let me be honest, because lots of people like to pretend that close protection is this, uh, you know, it's Kevin Costner and, and Whitney Houston. Yes. Well, of course, of course, there is a large part of that, uh, but that tends to be overseas. Here, working for Arab families or uh, a, a European family that I worked for at one point and a Russian family, um, a lot of it to be honest with you, is bag carrying. You know, you, you follow them when you're going around shopping. It's not particularly glamorous, let's put it that way. There were some, some jobs that I did um, in close protection that, that were a little bit more, for example, I went out to India for a month. I was looking after a gentleman and his, and his kids out there. And we had a large armed team. 
uh, mainly there was two of us that went out from the UK, but the rest were all off duty, uh, Indian police and army, all armed. So, um, but yeah, I found the transition difficult. I went into security, to be honest with you, for the money. And because I already had contacts doing that, uh -huh. they were offering me, offering me work. So I went in as a self-employed person and I did that for, for many, many years. I think, I think it was about 14 years. That's a long time. It was a long time. And I'll, I'll be honest, there, there were periods during that where I, I broke away to do other things, but always ended up going back to security. Um, yeah, there were, some, there were some good jobs, um, some very good jobs uh, in amongst those 14 years. But, you know, security by its very nature has to be pretty dull because if it's, if it's not dull and things have got lively, it normally means that something's gone wrong somewhere along the line. So, it, you know, you want it to be monotonous. You want it to be uh, quiet because, yes. of course, you know, otherwise something has gone wrong. Yes, that's true. So doing that has been another, another way to help people, protection, and you have also done caregiving as well. So that takes yeah. a lot of dedication. I can, I can say absolutely, hand on heart, that the six, and it was only for six months, but the six months that I, I worked in a care home looking after the elderly, it was the hardest job that I've ever done. It was, it was extremely hard physically and it was extremely hard emotionally. Um, very, very rewarding. Uh, met some fantastic characters. Became very, very attached. And uh, yeah, you know, one particular gentleman I looked after, I can't mention his name, but he'd been on the D-Day landings. So when you're talking to somebody oh who went through the D-Day landings and the stories that, that he's telling you, it's very, I mean, it's making the hair stand up on the back of my neck now. It's really powerful stuff. And although a lot of caregiving is, is dirty work, um, I found it extremely rewarding. Uh, the reason I left, uh, A, the money is extremely bad, and B, the staff get treated appallingly uh, by the comp the, these big companies. So I actually, uh, if I was being honest, I actually... The care home that I worked in had had all the management removed because they failed. What we we have a the CQC here, but basically the, the Care Quality Commission had come in after complaints, and all of the management had been removed, and they brought in um, a new management team who, quite frankly, from their head office, who proceeded, although all of the failings were at management level, they they came in and, and started to take it out on the on the girls on the ground. I was the only guy at the time working there. And these were the most dedicated, hardworking, caring people that I've ever had the pleasure to work with. And the management just seemed to take it out on them, really. Um, so I'm not one for holding back on how I feel or, or what I'm thinking, and that didn't go down particularly well. So That's really unfortunate because it's those patients who really need people like you. And when management doesn't realize the value of what you do to pass on to the patient and patient care suffers. And so that's really a sad situation. But from there, you also have done business ownership. And one of the things that I found really interesting to learn was your perception of an industry that really makes a lot of money on people and that was the alcohol business and you were the first in the UK there to have an alcohol delivery business. So there are a number of alcohol delivery businesses all illegal and some of them had, had been operated in certain parts of the country for, for a long time uh, but all underground. Um, so yeah we were the first because uh, I had a business partner at the time to uh, go to court and apply for an actual license to do it. Uh, I found that what I believe was a loophole in the licensing laws, uh, having studied alcohol licensing when I left the army. And um, we presented that to the court and the court, the judge rolled his eyes uh, and 
said he thought I had a good point. They would allow us to go ahead with it. Uh, he was ex-military, actually, the judge. And my business partner was still serving in the military at the time. So I think he was uh, quite kind to us because nobody else had managed to, uh, to pull it off. Um, and it was, a, it was a, a big success. But, um, yeah, the, there were times where you call into question uh, what you're doing. Uh, I, you, you may be touching on it later, but, um, I, you know, I've had my own bar company, a couple of my own bar companies, and, and there were occasions where I thought, is, is, this, is this my purpose in life? getting people in this state. Um, so whilst we made a lot of people very happy and provided what proved to be a, a, a really um, popular service, looking back now, you know, you do question as to whether that was a, a meaningful uh, job to be doing. It's interesting you say that. And when we come to different points in our life, we realize certain things and how it affects different areas, not only in our, our own lives, but the lives of others. And when I looked at the things that you were doing with your life coaching uh, service, I was really impressed. And I have a copy of your book, 12 Steps. I was very kind of you to go out and get that. Thank you very much. Yes, the 12 Steps, A Life-Ready Motivational Guide. Let me just share with the audience a little bit about this before we go further with what you're doing, because this is absolutely an incredible read, and I'm going to tell you why. Every part of this book is essential. You can't put in your brain one part of the book without learning something that can be very applicable to you, no matter how much you think you've mastered something in your own life, because at different stages, different things come up in your life. And sometimes we have to different to relearn different things or go back and revisit different applications that we thought we've mastered and start reinstituting them. But every point that you make in this book is not only valid, and needed, but it's even essential to the environment and society that we're living in now. There well, is, thank you. you're welcome. This is, this is an unbelievable step-by-step -step guide. And the way I would recommend reading this, because to really get an understanding of how to apply this to somebody's life, I think they need to read it, the book from front cover to back cover, and then go step by step by step. Yeah. It is unbelievable because not only is it a read, but it's a template. You take, you take what information is given in here and then you have homework assignments to do on yourself. Yeah, I think that's the important thing is that people actually do do that. That they, yes. you know, they, they answer those questions in the book because one of the things I find, and, and we, we've spoken briefly be before, of course, is that writing things down is, is the way forward. Pencil, notepad, get things written down. It makes things happen. You know, it's, it's so important to do that. I agree with that. And some of the things that I share with people all pretty often, um, is that there is something that goes from the brain throughout the hand and onto the paper that actually makes things work by Absolutely. doing that versus typing it on the computer. So even though we're in the digital age and digital media and technology is fantastic, there is something that the brain through the wiring, syntaxes, neurotransmitters, whatever it is, really makes a difference when it goes from the brain throughout the hand and then when reading it and writing it back from the paper through the hand to the brain and it's just in the eyes through the brain so it's really it's really quite something and um so i'm really impressed with this and i really want the audience to get to grab a copy of this and i will say here in the united states you can get it through amazon i did so, yeah, I was really surprised that you did get it, actually. Yeah. Yes. Fantastic.
So even globally, there is no stopping us from being able to obtain the information that we want and sharing information such as what you're doing with your business now, domestic abuse business support. Can you tell the audience what this is and why it's essential now? So domestic abuse business support is, is for me really, really important because when you are in an abusive relationship, one of your moments of escape is when you're at work. I was targeted at work by my abuser. And um, it's only been recently that, that this has really hit home to me. Because you always think about what goes on in the four walls of your own home when you're being abused. And as somebody who was abused at work, it was only when I was doing my research and helping people um, in life coaching and then moving down the different paths to domestic abuse that I started coming across figures like 75% of domestic abuse victims are targeted at work. So that's a huge number. Two million people, uh, 695,000 men and 1.3 million women last year in the UK were victims of domestic abuse. Of course, they're, they're only the ones that were reported and recorded. Uh, so we know there's many, many more. Um, that so to that is a huge out, number. It is a huge number. And to find out that 75% that of them are, can't even get away from their abuser at work, is it's horrific to have to go through that at work as well and as i say you know i remember what it was like for me and uh yeah it was awful so i i was already giving talks about domestic abuse and about my own experiences to frontline staff particularly police officers and uh and i thought uh, do you know what i i need to i need to do something bigger that i need to have far more impact so I looked at companies that were offering support in businesses, and there are, there are only really a couple here in the UK. Um, but as with most things domestic abuse, you're either in one camp or you're in the other. It's we're looking after men or we're looking after women. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, I can't, I can't deal with that because for me, it's about everybody, every victim. and. I've, I use the word victim because um, although I don't like it, I don't like the word victim. Um, but unfortunately, you know, it's one of those words when we're talking about this that quite often comes out. I prefer the terms sufferers and survivors. Yes. But, um, you know, I think that's a little bit more empowering. Um, uh, survivors certainly is. Um, so I just thought, you know, we need to do more about this. and We need to get into the workplace and we need to support all sufferers and survivors of domestic abuse, not just men, not just women, uh, but, but everybody, regardless of their gender, their sexuality, you know, their ethnicity. I don't care. If you identify as being somebody who's going through a domestic abuse situation, then we want to help. Yes, I think that this is so important because like you said, the numbers are high and here in the United States, we have seen a number of very volatile situations where people have had fatal incidences regarding domestic abuse that have stemmed from the home into the workplace. And this yeah. is unacceptable. It's unacceptable for any fatalities or for abuse, period. But we know that it exists. And here's the thing. We need to figure out what to do to protect ourselves in the workplace. Yeah, I think uh, certainly businesses here in the UK, there, there is legislation um, that, that covers it. But most businesses don't seem to want to get involved in their employees personal lives and I can kind of understand that but what businesses uh, I, I use the term businesses generally there uh, business owners business leaders managers need to get their head around is that it's not just about helping the employee it's about helping the business yes. because here in the U here in the UK billions of pounds are being lost uh, by businesses every year because of um, Employees who are going through domestic abuse situations, taking days off, you know, uh, loss in productivity. Yeah, the list is endless. And if you have a situation 
um, whereby, and I'll give you one example, um, a hairdresser, her husband, who she recently left, burst into the hairdressers and, and shot her with a, a shotgun in front of her work colleagues, uh, all of the people, the ladies that were waiting to have their, their hair done. It's a massive impact. You know, yes. such, it's, you're not just talking about the, the victim, using that word because that's a good word for this situation, but not just the victim, but the business as a whole that may never recover from something like that. Um, the dozens of people who, are, who will have trauma for the rest of their lives from witnessing that. And of course, luckily in this instance, um, the lady involved did survive. Uh, but unfortunately, while she was in hospital recovering, her 16-year-old son killed himself because of, of what had happened. So it's a, a terrible, terrible story. That is, um, that is a terrible story. She has recovered from that, and she is now doing huge and very positive work uh, for domestic abuse. But business owners, uh, managers need to look at the bigger picture. Will your, will your business even uh, survive something like that happening? Now, it is few and far, you know, attacks like that with a gun are incredibly rare in this country. But there was another incident very, very similar, again, with the hairdressers, funny enough, where, where the boyfriend or ex-boyfriend burst in and, and stabbed the poor lady to death in, again in front of other staff and customers, uh, causing terrible trauma and loss um you know it's and and it was preventable it was certainly preventable from happening in the workplace uh, with a few a few things that could have been put in place um so so it's it's a sad loss really that, that yes. didn't need to happen yes and here in the united states in orange county california i believe it was just a few years ago that an incident occurred very similar to that at a hair salon <laughs> there so these things are not only happening here in the United States, they're happening in the UK and other places all over the world. And if you really think about it, in terms of a 24 hour day, if you were to spend eight of it sleeping and eight of it say at home, the other eight hours is at a workplace. So I think our employers and organizations out there really need to think about their involvement with their employees and how to protect them because yeah. ultimately that is a home away from home and it is also a mechanism of funding for that organization where they will lose a lot of money and not only that but when there is negative attention drawn to a situation for a specific company then people tend to stay away from that area that organization and it ultimately isn't good for the the business's business so we we yeah. had a recent incident not too long ago here um, involving a major chain of stores that happened in texas it was one store where a shooting incident happened and so oh, there these things happen but the name of the company, especially if it's a well-known name of a company, sticks in there. And anytime there is further negative association, whether it's domestic abuse or not, these things stay in the minds of consumers. And it is an ultimate loss in productivity for that business. Not yeah, only absolutely. absolutely. Yes. So there's many, many reasons to look at it. And you and I both have our our focus on safety. That is number one. We both come from helping people, caring for people and protecting people. That's our, that's our biggest focus and helping people overcome situations like domestic abuse and um, also preventing that. But focusing on the business aspect is something that is really needed. And like you said, it isn't, it isn't something that's common, especially where you are at. Yeah, the um, shootings and stabbings, I mean, stabbings is, is on the rise here in the UK, particularly in London, but uh, talking about domestic abuse, um, far more women are killed than men, that, that's for sure. And women remain the, supposedly, 
current statistics show, women remain the, the majority at 1.3 million last year um, victims, whilst men remain the higher number of perpetrators. Um, but going back to the big, if I, if I may, just going back to the bigger picture, um, it's not just the domestic abuse. The domestic abuse is where it starts, but recently figures were released showing that people who've experienced domestic abuse are three times more likely to develop serious mental health issues. Mm -hmm. So, again, there's another avenue. You could be losing employees or the fact that you, you may have that employee in work, but he's, he or she is just not working to their full potential because that their mind is elsewhere or they're suffering mental health issues. And of course, that then connects to suicide. And if we're, we're then talking about men, I don't know about the US, but certainly here in the UK, male suicide rates are at epidemic proportions. Yes. And it's just frightening figures for male suicides. And um, of course, if you have a mental health issue, again, you are more likely to commit and succeed at committing suicide so it's a huge picture costing not just that individual business but the uh the global economy an absolute fortune so it makes sense to deal with it at its earliest stage well you have a good point too because it's affecting the medical industry as well yeah. i mean you've got, you've got more appointments there more medications absolutely and it it really is an issue that needs to be addressed and it's preventable. The thing is oftentimes, like I said, a third of the time we we're spending in the workplace and oftentimes coworkers know us just like we know our family members and they're seeing signs of domestic abuse, abuse and are, are not reporting it. They don't know who to report it to or they don't know how to help the person that they see is being victimized. Yeah, I completely agree with you. But of course, the other the other big problem is the fact that a lot of people who are suffering from domestic abuse either a don't see themselves as being in a, in a domestic an abusive relationship. Mm -hmm. um, you know that that's been shown um, to be one of the big reasons is that people don't. It's only when people look back they they go, oh, do you know what? I was in a domestic abuse situation um so it's, it's educating everybody a those that are going through those issues getting out into the businesses talking to them and hopefully having people who are going through those experiences go oh wow that's me I, i'm actually in, a, in an abusive relationship i just thought he or she was being you know just not a nice person but actually this is abuse it's helping them to realise that they're actually in an abusive relationship so that hopefully they will then take the next most difficult step, which is, of course, reaching out to somebody and saying, look, I need help. I think I'm in this situation. Yes. Uh, it's something that we offer as a business uh, is that ongoing support, is that, um, that active listening, sitting down with that person and allowing them to tell their story about what's going on in their life without judging them, and let them get it all off their chest, probably for the first time. Uh, and then offering ongoing support, signposting those people to, to relevant agencies that can help them depending on their gender, sexuality and ethnicity. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a big job. It's a big job getting people to realise that they are, A, in that abusive relationship, and B, that really difficult part is getting people to reach out and seek the help that they need I certainly for you. men you know men men are uh, one of the main reasons given by men is that they feel completely ashamed uh that um they don't want to admit to to being you know taking a beating at home from their partner um so there are, there are so many issues it's a very very complex um area domestic abuse uh, but of course at the same time it's it's incredibly interesting and very re rewarding i can see that uh, let me ask you so for anyone who would be interested in learning more about dab's domestic abuse mm -hmm. business support and finding out how you can assist them are you 
solely working in the UK or are you able to assist people globally? So just recently, actually, um, I was approached by somebody on LinkedIn who asked me the same question and I hadn't given it any thought. But you and I have, have spoken over the phone before today uh, and I've spoken to a number of other people overseas. And particularly when we spoke and, and you start to see with our similar backgrounds of the military and police and you start to see the similarities. And can I just say, I don't, your book is downstairs. Um, so I don't have it here to hold up, but what a fantastic read that was. I went, I went through it so quickly and as a, as a police officer, it really resonated with me. And, um, I'm actually Thank going you. to, whenever I do future talks to the police, I will be taking that with me and saying and, and recommending that they get themselves a copy and, and read through that because I just thought that that was a fantastic, uh, fantastic book and really showed your, you know, the fact of how much you cared as a, as a police officer, um, you know, to help these people because, I mean, we could talk all night about this, but um, my experiences with the police have all been incredibly negative uh, when I was going through my abuse. So, um, yeah, I thought it was a, a fantastic, fantastic book. Thank you. And I've gone off on a tangent now. I can't remember what the original question was. So I'm sorry about that. <laughs> well, I want to I wanna ensure that the audience who is oh. watching this, both there in the UK, here yeah. in the United States, and anywhere else that this is being broadcast, which is global now, if yeah. they would like to utilize your services, if you're able to assist them globally via Skype or in some other method. Absolutely. So, yeah. I remember where we were now. <laughs> yeah, um, only recently started thinking about this. And because when we talked and I talked to other people, the similarities are so striking that I thought, you know, you know, of course I want to help people here. But at the end of the day, if somebody wants me to um, talk via Skype or, or even fly out, then I, I would be happy to do that. Because at the end of the day, it's about helping all sufferers and survivors of domestic abuse, wherever they may be. So if, I, if my story will help somebody, whether it's here or in the US or, or anywhere else, then uh, that, that's a positive thing. I absolutely love it. And for the audience, can you share with them both of the sites on where they can find your book and what they would need to do to get the motivational support in the step-by-step -step program, the 12 step life ready motivational guide, as well as the link to dabs. So you got robinswells.com, which is my life coaching, which really gave me the groundwork, I think, um, uh, for the domestic abuse work that I'm now doing. You know, I was well and firm, firmly on the life coaching road, but as I've said before, you know, you've got to keep your eyes and ears open to new opportunities. And really, after trying to bury my story of domestic abuse for 10 years, uh, when I eventually started to talk about it, the life coaching helped me to go down that road to helping others with the domestic abuse. So robertswells.com for that. And for dabs, it's a little bit more complicated. wwwd dash a dash b dash s dot co dot uk fortunately i couldn't get dot com on that one somebody's because of course it's uh dabs is a, a funny modern dance isn't it they do that or something i don't know what that's all about but, i love it so uh, but uh yeah so um or of course you can contact me directly uh the book is available on amazon uh you can find it on there uh under under its title uh and my name so yeah that'd be Obviously, I'd be delighted. I, I deliberately set the price low. Um, you know, people said, oh, why are you doing this? Is it a financial thing? Well, I'd have to sell a, a lot of books to, to really make any money off it because it's, it's done through Amazon. So they get the, the, the large percentage of, yes. of, of any book that's bought. Um, I did it really, and it sounds cliche, but I genuinely did it because I thought if this helps just one person, then you know, it was worthwhile. And I actually thought when I wrote it that if just one person brought the book, I'd be delighted. So thank you. <laughs>
Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for your dedication and focusing on this really needed area of focus and the passion that I share with you. I am so delighted that someone has the same, same internal burning desire to get this issue addressed, even if it changes just one life. Yeah, as I say, it sounds cliche, but, um, but it really is true, isn't it? Um, yes, if, it is. If just, if just by telling my story uh, of what I went through, you know, with my background, I, I, I never thought for one second that I would be somebody who could become a victim to domestic abuse. Not with my background, not, you know, ex-military police, uh, security professional. You just think that's never going to happen to me. And in fact, I'd known someone actually um, uh, just after I left the army, and a lady who had been very, very badly beaten by her partner. And I was one of those people who used the phrase, why don't you just walk away? Um, you know, it shows an incredible level of ignorance to say that to somebody. Um, and as a military police officer uh, attending many domestics, I never, ever once, never thought to myself when I walked into a room that the man could, could be the victim. Um, I was very, cl very close-minded. And, you know, it embarrasses me now. I look back and I think, well, whilst I didn't receive the, the training back then uh, to, to recognise that, um, you know, it's a shame there would have been people that needed my help that didn't get it. So I, I've got a lot of work to do to make up for that. Well, I thank you so much for being with me today. And I know that the audience appreciates you and the information that you're sharing and all the things that you're doing as well. Thank you, Rebecca. It's been absolutely amazing. We could talk all night. Well, I certainly could anyway. I know we could. <laughs> I will have yeah. you back on the show. We have so much more that we could talk about. So we'll do some absolutely. more very, very specific things in upcoming shows. And I will definitely be having you back. You're doing a fantastic job. I've, I've been watching loads of your interviews uh, on so many different uh, platforms. It's incredible. You're doing a great job. You know, Thank some of the you. interviews that I've seen have been absolutely fantastic, really informative and, and very enjoyable to watch. So keep up the great work. And I really do hope that we can talk again. Absolutely. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in to another episode of Rebecca Sounds Reveille. Today's focus is really ensuring that those in the business specter take a hard look at addressing workplace abuse in reference to the employees and in the environment and creating a solution that will ultimately affect everyone in the communities, whether it's here in the UK, in the United States or in the UK or any other countries that may be watching. And for those that are here in the United States that really want to talk to somebody, they can about being a victim in an abusive situation, they can call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline, which is 1-800-799-SAFE. That's S-A-F-E, 1-800-799-S-A-F-E. They can actually also contact me as a domestic violence expert and the creator of Vote Victims Overcoming Traumatic Events. I can definitely mentor you and talk to you and direct you with tools and resources sources such as Robert's program and his motivational steps that can help you and really, really lay a foundation in clarity on some areas that will move you in a direction that is life changing as well. You definitely want to connect with him for information in the UK as well as here with getting a copy of the 12 Steps Motivation Life Ready Motivational Guide and for business support, whether it's here in the United States or in the UK. Thanks for tuning in. I ask that you share this episode with your friends, your family, loved ones, those that you know all over social media, and those you don't. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you. Take care.